Icicles, icicles of hard stone, called stalactites, formed by the slow drip, dripping of water over millions of years. And below the stalactites, cones of stone, fed by the same drops. Water slips down these stony fingers, collects in pools, spills into underground rivers, and carves out vast caverns which meander beneath the earth. Strange as it seems, it's the formation of these stone icicles that hints at one of the remarkable properties of water. Stalactites form because water is capable of dissolving minerals and depositing them, atom by atom, to create some of the planet's most exquisite sculptures. And it is this property, the ability to dissolve minerals, that enables water to support life. Making up the bulk of a living cell, water carries within it dissolved minerals and other nutrients, the very lifeblood of the organism. Water is composed of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms looking a little like a Mickey Mouse molecule. Each hydrogen ear has a slight positive charge and the oxygen head a slight negative charge. Acting like tiny magnets, water molecules attract each other and form a loosely bonded network. In this arrangement, they stick together but allow plenty of space for minerals to be carried about. This mineral may not look familiar, but it's a chunk of salt. At the microscopic level, a salt molecule is composed of one sodium atom attached to a chlorine atom. When salt is immersed in water, the water magnets weaken the bond between the sodium and the chlorine atoms and pull them apart. In this flexible cradle, water carries salt in solution. water can carry many different minerals that flow through the living cell. People are water creatures made up of billions of cells. 70% of the human body is composed of water water that moves the human machine. While water is essential for all our internal biological functions, its availability determines the quality of our lives. In fact, it's very difficult to think of any human activity that doesn't involve the use of water.
And unlike most natural resources, water is one of the few renewable resources, one we can use over and over again. Since the formation of the planet, the amount of water has remained fixed, replenishing the land in an endless cycle. Water is caught up in the mighty planetary engine involving the tug of the sun and the pull of gravity. As the sun heats the oceans, water evaporates and lifts into the atmosphere. After the moist air is chilled, water vapor condenses into droplets and falls back to earth as precipitation. seeps into the ground and flows back to the oceans where it is hoisted upwards again in an endless pathway called the hydrological cycle. of plenty is an illusion because over 97% of the water is in the oceans and salt water is simply not suitable for drinking or irrigation. Two percent is locked up as ice in the polar regions where only polar bears make much use of it. That leaves less than 1% available as fresh water. Because percentages tend to be forgettable, imagine all the water on the globe in a one liter container. The total amount of fresh water would fill only a teaspoon. And this single drop represents all the water contained in the lakes and rivers of the continents. One drop, that's all there is. Surprisingly, the rest of the teaspoon is groundwater, which lies hidden beneath the surface. For example, buried below the central plains of the United States, is a vast underground reservoir called the Ogallala Aquifer. If we were aware of the amount of water in the Ogallala Aquifer, we might be tempted to rename the Great Lakes the Lesser Lakes. Still, we shouldn't think of an aquifer as an underground lake. Rather, the ground beneath the surface soaks up and releases water much like a sponge. The Ogallala was formed millions of years ago when sand, gravel, and water washed down from the Rocky Mountains to form the flat plains of the Midwest. For eons, the slow seepage of rainwater into the ground 
has been balanced by the amount of water that flows from the ground into streams and rivers. In the southern Ogallala, farmers have drilled thousands of wells to tap into the aquifer. Underground water is being used to produce bumper crops on what is normally arid land. Treating the great aquifer as if it were a bottomless well, farmers are pumping up the water faster than nature can replace it. And they are beginning to pay the price. In the southern edges of the Ogallala, water levels are dropping a meter a year. Unable to finance the drilling of deeper wells, many farmers are abandoning the land. Scenes like this remind us that water supplies are not limitless. Excessive withdrawal is not the only way we abuse fresh water. Pollution is the other. Water is one tough customer. It accepts everything we throw at it. Discharge industrial waste into the water, and water remains water, only it becomes contaminated with dissolved and suspended chemicals. Though water is indestructible, it can be loaded to the point where it becomes a tainted fluid a hazardous liquid, and finally, a poisonous muck. Now these well-kept homes don't look as threatening as industrial plants, not at first glance. Water is such a wonderful transport medium that we use it to get rid of all sorts of home waste. And this adds up, 20 liters of flush, 120 liters a bath, 1,000 liters a day, a million homes, and a deadly river of waste gushes from the city. And where does the sewage go? Sad to say, many North American communities still flush their raw sewage straight into their rivers and bays. Popular wisdom held that rivers and oceans could handle the load. That is, until nature kicked back. For those cities around the Great Lakes, sewage treatment plants are, for the most part, inadequate. Whether the system is old or new, the method of cleaning water is essentially the same. Raw sewage from a city's network of sewers funnels into the plant. To remove suspended objects, such as hair and plastics, the water passes through a strainer. The water then flows to a chamber where fine particles of sand sink to the bottom. Next, the water spills into a settling tank where floating oil and grease are skimmed off mechanically. The final stage involves spraying water into the air, where it picks up an abundant supply of oxygen. Here, nature is called upon to do the cleanup job. Encouraged to work overtime with an ample incentive of oxygen, bacteria which thrive on sewage break down such organics as urine, feces, and kitchen wastes and convert them to harmless sludge. At the end of the line, crystal clear, disease-free water is returned to the lake. In theory, all infectious germs such as typhoid, diphtheria, and cholera 
have been removed. But here is where the shortcoming of the system shows up. The discharge water still contains toxic metals, such as mercury and arsenic. Neglected by bacteria, toxic metals remain in solution. And other chemicals, such as dioxins and PCBs, cruise like deadly submarines in the water. Molecules that bacteria simply cannot break down. Slowly but surely, these toxic chemicals are passed from one organism to another up the food chain. When the fish dies, the gull hijacks more than it bargained for a deadly cargo of chemicals. Because they persist for years, these chemicals begin to accumulate in the lakes. So, that extraordinary property of water, the ability to carry chemicals, is the very property which can turn water into a poisonous brew. At one time, the great engine that cycles water around the globe had built-in pollution control devices. As water evaporated, it was purified and temporarily stored in clouds. Today, however, waters that once sweetened the land fall as sour, acid rain. In times past, when surface water seeped underground, the earth filtered and stored it in deep caverns. Now, drop by drop, chemically laden waters percolate beneath the ground, contaminate fresh water supplies, and poison the lifeblood of the planet. Each spring, soft, gentle breezes stir the waters of this northern Canadian lake. And each spring, the lake brings forth abundant life. Generation after generation, animals return to feed in its nourishing waters. And 
Generation after generation, they grow stronger and healthier. This is a nearby lake, named Lake 223. 223 sounds like a tombstone marker, a fitting name for a lake which is quite dead. Back in 1977, scientists began to pour raw acid into it. And to be fair to the scientists, they didn't like conducting this type of experiment. But by sacrificing one lake, they hoped to learn how acid rain was threatening the life of thousands of North American lakes. But where does acid rain come from? These are industrial plants along the Mississippi. These coal-fired power plants in Ohio. And this a smelting operation in northern Ontario. These smokestacks emit sulfur dioxide, which we'll represent as yellow spheres. And when mixed with oxygen, water, and sunlight in the atmosphere, becomes sulfuric acid. Each year, power plants and industries in North America spew out a staggering 35 million tons of sulfur dioxide gas. The equivalent of permitting every man, woman and child in Canada and the United States to pour several drums of sulfuric acid into his or her favorite lake. Sulfuric acid is one of a class of highly reactive chemicals. Pour sulfuric acid on concrete, and the concrete turns to mush. What makes an acid so reactive? An acid contains both attached hydrogen atoms and unattached hydrogen atoms, given the special name protons. Put simply, a substance which can donate protons is an acid, and a substance which can accept protons is a base. When an acid and a base are mixed, the protons are snapped up by the molecules in the base. This reaction is called neutralization. Neutralizing is another way of saying that acids and bases knock each other out of commission. Now, another way of reducing the effect of an acid is to dilute it with water. Dilution reduces the concentration of protons or thins them out, so to speak. These three beakers contain an equal amount of acid. Dilute the second beaker with water. And the last beaker with more water. Insert a metal coil in each beaker, and the speed of reaction becomes apparent. So the concentration of protons determines how reactive an acid is. The more protons, the more reactive the acid. And that is the way acidity is measured. It's called the pH scale and is numbered from 0 to 14.
The most reactive acid solution on the scale is given a value of zero. And the most reactive base is given a value of 14. Seven, the midpoint on the scale, separates acids from bases. It is the pH of distilled water and is considered neutral. pH scale, then, is a topsy-turvy measurement. However, it's the scale we're stuck with. As long as we remember, the lower the number, the more reactive the acid, it's a useful way of ranking acidity. Now this may come as a surprise, but even clean rain is mildly acidic. 5.6 on the pH scale. Rain is naturally acidic because when carbon dioxide in the atmosphere mixes with water, it forms a weak acid. So human produced acid rain is precipitation which has a pH number below 5.6. And very low pH numbers, which again means high acidity, have been recorded in the northeastern parts of the United States. In certain places downwind of smokestacks, rain with a pH of 2 has fallen, the acidity of lemon juice. More often, polluted rain has a value between 3.6 to 5.6 primarily the result of burning fossil fuels. Two of the nastiest byproducts of fossil fuel combustion are sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide because they produce the most damaging forms of acid rain. As we saw earlier, sulfur dioxide is converted into sulfuric acid. In a similar manner, when nitrogen oxide combines with oxygen and water in the atmosphere, nitric acid is formed. And just how nasty a direct hit of sulfuric acid and nitric acid can be is obvious from the blight surrounding the smelting operations in Sudbury, Ontario, back in the 1950s. Something had to be done to make life bearable in the community. So the company built a towering stack and dispersed the pollutants well out of harm's reach, so they thought. And ten years later, the remedy cleaned up the backyard. Yes, it did. All over North America, industry opted for sky-high chimneys as a solution to pollution except that the practice came to be called dumping on your neighbor. For example, acid-forming pollutants produced in the Ohio Valley are picked up by prevailing winds and transported hundreds of kilometers to the northeastern states and southern Canada. In this manner, Acid precipitation falls as rain or snow far from the point of emission. Typically, the acidity of a northern Canadian lake is pH 6.8, very close to neutral. Under normal circumstances, lakes are capable of handling natural acid rain. Because soils contain bases, the action of the bases in the runoff and in the bottom of lakes neutralizes the mildly acid rain. But as constant human-produced acid rain falls from the skies, the pH of the lakes begins to fall. Quite simply, the soil and rock cannot supply enough bases to neutralize the acids. And just how sensitive aquatic organisms are to acid stress becomes evident in the experiment at Lake 223 
over a seven-year period. In 1977, year one, the pH is lowered from 6.8 to 6.1, and all organisms cope with the change. Year two, the pH is lowered to 5.9. Some microscopic organisms at the bottom of the food chain begin to die off. Minnows fail to reproduce. Year three, pH 5.7. Crayfish skeletons begin to soften. And minnows are near extinction. Year four, pH 5.6. Crayfish eggs and trout eggs fail to hatch. Year five, pH five. No eggs of any fish have hatched. Year six, and holding at pH five, no young fish of any species survive. Year seven, and still holding at pH five, crayfish and insects have all disappeared. Only a few large trout remain, but are beginning to starve. The lake is crystal clear now. The clarity of a watery tomb. Like most large-scale field studies. The experiment may downplay what happens in reality, because the death of a lake may occur much faster. Considerable acid precipitation accumulates as snow throughout the winter months. Then, as the spring thaw occurs, lakes are hit with an acid pulse. Acidic meltwater in the streams. Coincides with fish spawning, so that in all likelihood, fish eggs would be wiped out faster than the Lake 223 experiment indicates. As if that were not enough, acid rain carries yet another poison pill. When acid rain seeps into soils surrounding the lake, it frees up aluminum, which is normally locked up in the soil and rocks. The aluminum is then carried into the lake. Aluminum is one of the deadliest poisons fish can encounter, because it attacks their gills. Fish respond by producing a mucus, which chokes off the oxygen supply. The result is death by suffocation within a few days. Certainly, if acid rain is chemical warfare against lakes, it's a declaration of total war against the forests. Each tree becomes a fortress under siege. Phase one of the assault is an aerial bombardment. When acid rain falls on the needles or leaves of a tree, it leaches the nutrients from the leaves at a faster rate. Then the roots can replenish them. Phase two of the assault cuts off the supply route. Acid rain seeps into the soil and leaches out the mineral nutrients the plant desperately needs. Minerals such as calcium, magnesium, and potassium. Are carried off beyond the reaches of the roots. Phase three undermines the foundation. The acid frees up aluminum, which the hungry roots readily absorb.
Unfortunately, aluminum blocks the uptake of the few vital minerals that do remain in the soil. The roots begin to wither and the fortress is breached. Sickened, the tree can no longer ward off parasites. Weakened, it will eventually crumble against the battering of wind. Vast tracts of forests in America are in a sad state of decline, while millions of hectares are barely hanging on to life. Now let's put our knowledge of chemistry to work. Since bases neutralize acids, why not dump bases into acidified lakes? And that's exactly what some researchers are attempting to do. But it would be a futile attempt to treat a million lakes. Besides, there aren't enough hands available to offset the day-to-day -day acid assault. In fact, there is no quick fix to acid rain. The only solution to the menace is to counterattack at the source. This stack in Sudbury used to be one of North America's worst offenders. But by installing clean air technology in the plant, this smelting operation has reduced its airborne emissions by 90%. It cost one half billion dollars for the system. But the results downwind will pay dividends. The cost will be passed on to the consumers, and that is as it should be, for each and every one of us must contribute to making this a greener planet. the delight of dirt. <laughs> the joy of soil on the skin feels so good. Doesn't taste bad either. Looks just fine. Alas, 
His joy is short-lived, and so is the age of innocence. He is about to learn one of the first rules of civilization. Soil is unsightly. There, that's much better. Now he looks spick and span. Put him in front of a television set. No harm in that. But wait a minute. What are those guys doing? Even big guys love to play in dirt. Now that looks like fun. Except when he grows up, he'll play on artificial turf. Strange, this grown-up revulsion for soil. In modern cities, people go out of their way to avoid contact with it. Architects and developers seem obsessed with removing every vestige of the natural landscape. A cement plaza is so much cleaner than a park. And before long, we should be able to pave over this pasture and replace it with concrete. Perhaps if we realized that the bulldozer can destroy in minutes what has taken nature thousands of years to create, we might think twice about what we do with our soils. Soil is a remarkable substance, a self-sustaining machine. For thousands and thousands of seasons, the forests thrived and cared for themselves without a gram of artificial fertilizer. Yes, Soil is a maintenance-free system that provides plants with all the essential nutrients for growth. Without lifting a finger, we can watch plants of every description flourish. Sure, we can make soil, but compared to nature, our efforts are small scale. First, Select a firm material that will allow the plants to take root. Add the seeds. Then carefully meter water at a rate that will not drown the roots. Finally, the essential elements, including phosphorus and nitrogen, must be constantly fed to the plants. Oh, it's a system that works, but it's a one-way system that requires the steady input of nutrients. When the product is packed up and shipped off to market, the nutrients are lost to the system and must be replaced. On the other hand, nature evolved the tick-over solution by recycling most of the nutrients. How then does this natural system turn over endlessly? To begin with, rock contains most of the mineral nutrients plants require to grow but these minerals are locked up in the rock.
Through the process of weathering, rocks are slowly ground down to small particles. The coarse particles are sand. The finer particles, silt. And the very finest, clay. Yet, none of these particles alone makes up soil. While sand provides air space, it can't retain water. Silt and clay, on the other hand, contain such small pore spaces that water and air cannot penetrate easily. Now here is a moist environment containing the right mixture of sand, silt, and clay, recently washed down from the bank. Strange, then, that except for some hardy weeds, few plants grow here. Some ingredients must be missing, and what those might be is best revealed by nature itself. Here is the first clue, the forest floor covered with dead leaves. And beneath the dead leaves, decomposed leaves. And beneath the decomposition, dark, rich soil. This dark soil contains finely broken down plant matter called humus. Without humus, there could be no forest for the living thrives on the dead. Life is rooted in death, and as odd as it sounds, it's a relationship we're going to probe to unravel the secrets of soil. To start with, plants don't do a very good job at taking up minerals and water from the soil. While root systems may appear extensive to the naked eye, by microscopic standards, the root hairs are few and far between. So hundreds of millions of years ago, plants struck a bargain with special organisms called fungi. Plants accepted the invasion of fungi, which extended their root systems a thousandfold. The fungi absorbed minerals in the soil and then passed these minerals on to the plants. But a bargain is a bargain. In exchange, plants provided the fungi with carbon-based foods which the fungi couldn't manufacture on their own. It seemed like the perfect arrangement, except for one problem. Neither the plants nor the fungi could capture one of the main nutrients needed for growth. And that is the element nitrogen. There is an ample supply of it in the atmosphere, but nitrogen is a stubborn molecule. The atoms of the molecule are tightly bound, and neither plant nor fungi have the energy to split the molecule and turn it into nutrients. Enter the soil mechanics. Bacteria, called nitrogen fixers. Nitrogen fixing bacteria are remarkable single-celled creatures capable of absorbing nitrogen from the air. cracking it and using it for their own growth. Now, the fungi could take in the nitrogen by feasting on the bacteria's waste. Or 
or the bacteria themselves. But as long as the fungi and plant were dependent on these bacteria to supply nitrogen, both could grow no faster than the bacteria could supply the nitrogen. The strategy then was to acquire additional nitrogen by getting it from another source. And that other source was humus, a storehouse of nitrogen nutrients locked up in dead plants. But because dead plants don't readily release the keys to the storehouse, the living plant and fungi had to enlist a whole class of creatures called decomposers. Decomposers are the undertakers in the world of bacteria and fungi. These specialized organisms are capable of breaking down humus and releasing the nitrogen nutrients trapped in the humus. Now the fungi and roots are handed an ample and reliable supply of nitrogen. We can stand back now and see how nitrogen and other minerals are cycled from humus to decomposers, to living plants, back to humus. Left to themselves, the soil processors would release the nutrients from the humus much too rapidly for plants to use. So soil provides the ideal solution. Slow release mineral food capsules made up of a combination of silt and clay particles surrounding a small packet of humus. Here is how it works. When microorganisms eat humus, they release a type of sugar. The sugar glues very small particles of silt and clay together, sometimes forming a capsule, sealing off the humus. These capsules contain small openings which allow fungi and plant roots to eventually penetrate and gain access to the minerals. Through electrical charges, minerals pass from the capsule into the fungi or root. Now more microorganisms means more glue, and more glue means more capsules with billions of microorganisms forming a teaspoon of soil and untold numbers gluing together hectares of topsoil. An incredible hubbub of activity maintains the soil. Armored foragers scurry across the ground and chew up the dead plant matter. Scavenging earthworms await their turn to consume the fragments and pass on their waste to fungi and bacteria. Lest the population of these microorganisms runs out of control, little predators track them down and devour them. And like hungry sharks, single cell critters of every description gobble up bacteria day in and day out. This delicate balance between humus and living creatures sustains plant life on every continent. In North America, when settlers cleared the forests and grasslands two centuries ago, they started with a good bed of soil and treated it with care. They grew different crops from year to year. They allowed the land to recover by turning it to pasture from time to time and helped it along with wagon loads of manure. These techniques effectively maintained and even increased the organic material in the soil. 
But in the last 40 years, we have abandoned these practices in favor of intensive farming techniques. As the same crop is harvested year after year, less organic material is returned to the soil. The land is not allowed to recover. And when the deep plow bites into the ground, it crushes the humus in which the microorganisms live. And as the microorganisms decline, less nutrients are made available to the crops over the growing season. Without this rich supply of minerals, the farmer is forced to pour on expensive chemical fertilizers to make up for the shortfall. Finally, without the humus and microorganisms to hold the soil together, come the autumn rains, the soil is washed away. In fairness to farmers, they are close to the soil and have a vested interest in preserving it. And many farmers are beginning to rediscover the value of humus by kicking the age-old habit of deep plowing. Instead of burying the humus where microorganisms can't get at it, farmers are plowing narrow strips of ground, just deep enough to plant the seed. Others are experimenting with new methods of crop rotation, which renews the soil naturally. An English poet once wrote that he had glimpsed the world in a grain of sand. We have seen the world in a handful of soil and viewed the intimate and complex relationship between the living and the non-living. Never again should we treat our soil like dirt. Thank you.